Um, so, anyway. Let's get you guys clamped up. Now we are ready to work on this waistcoat. That one's gonna be fine. It's not this one, it's this one here, which is. Alright, I think that I'm good like this. Are we? Yeah, I think we are. But first, let's get my feet up. <laughs> Come on. Oh, okay, I get it. This ah, like that. There. Sorry for all the shaking, guys. I'm still getting used to everything. this to me there we go and we're just gonna pull up YouTube um, this cord here we're gonna put behind me oops Okay, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? There we go. Kiss <laughs> me. Such a funny girl. Actually, I might flip it this way. Kind of prefer working this direction. Okay, subscriptions. Okay, let's just go through my list. Welcome to another media analysis video because the interest on my student loan just keeps going up. <laughs> I need to put my degree to good use to feel better. If you're interested in watching similar videos like so far mainly on autism and media, fair coding, and disability inspiration form, then click the card in the top left of your screen to find that playlist.
This time we're going to be looking at OCD on the screen with the help of Rowan Ellis and Charlie Vincent, YouTubers who both have OCD and have kindly helped me with the script. I don't have OCD myself, so I am just helping to spread awareness and I'm very grateful for their input. Hey, I'm Rowan Ellis, I make videos on YouTube about LGBT Oh, Rowan Ellis! ...representation and pop culture, and I have primarily obsession about OCD. What's going on everybody? I'm Charlie Bloggs and I'm a YouTuber with OCD. I make a variety of videos from money saving challenges to talking about I apologize in advance for my dirty nails. Oh my goodness, I just realized how bad they are. Also, Discussia for sponsoring this video. I'll be telling you more about some of their anxiety reducing classes later. I'm betting you've seen not just one, but a number of characters on screen who are portrayed as a bit OCD. Or who aren't name checked as such, but just, you know, really, really love to clean. is not an adjective, it's the name of the disorder. We don't say, wow, she is so lupus. Or everyone's a bit cartilage disorder, so we don't. OCD is a mental health disorder that is both debilitating and torturous. It is not fun and it is not useful. Although, of course, always we can see positives in our situations. If I didn't have an intensely painful double sideways scoliosis, I wouldn't have such good posture. I mean, if I wasn't dyslexic, I probably would be able to spell peach, but I wouldn't be able to read so quickly. If that's how you spell peach, much better. Looking at neat and tidy spaces and wishing yours would be that way does not mean that you have OCD, because it is not just tidy, and it's not fun. No matter what Chloe Kardashian says. I know. Woof, 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 you okay? But also, this is my one moment of energy, so I'm just like grabbing it and going. Inaccurate media portrayals of OCD lead to these widely held misconceptions that in actual fact, OCD is debilitating. Those with conditions who do clean generally do so in utter misery because they feel compelled to do so, not because they love to do so. OCD is more than you think, and it affects more people than you would assume. About 2% adults suffers with the condition. According to the World Health Organization, OCD is one of the top 20 causes of illness-related disability worldwide for individuals between 15 and 44 years of age. When we think of OCD, our brains are probably likely to jump to uh, Monica Geller from Friends, Emma Pillsbury from Glee, or Mike. But they're all just depictions of very stereotypical OCD behaviours as observed from the outside. Also, their behaviour varies wildly depending on who's writing which episode, but it's neither here nor there. So what is OCD? Well, it isn't cute and it isn't quirky, as Charlie explains. When it comes to my own personal OCD, the thing that I struggle with the most are intrusive thoughts and what was that? Oh. related to those intrusive thoughts. I've got a little bit of dirt and germaphobia I, uh, sort of ordering things stabbed that myself I with to, but these don't really upset me, I suppose, and they don't really stress me out like the raw chicken and the locked doors thoughts, I can deal with it. They're light work. But the more distressing intrusive thoughts, but the more distressing intrusive thoughts are about my family members and loved ones being harmed, usually by me or other people. Most of the time, my brain will just come up with these fake scenarios and situations that are just never gonna happen in a million years. And as you can probably imagine, coming from an internal perspective and sort of, it's all coming from inside, so you think that there's something wrong with you. This can result in anxiety thought loops that can go on for genuinely hours and hours, sometimes days and weeks. The only thing I can compare it to is like being stuck in a room tied to a chair and being forced to watch a video recording with your eyes held open. That's the most accurate description I can give of it. People with OCD experience unwanted obsessions, which take the form of persistent and uncontrollable thoughts images, impulses, worries, fears, or doubts, or a combination of all these. They're intrusive, unwanted, and disturbing, and most importantly, significantly interfere with the sufferer's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis, as they're near impossible to ignore. OCD obsessions are ego-dystomic. That means they're the opposite of a person's values and self-concept, which can obviously be very anxiety-inducing and disturbing to the sufferer. Yes, People with OCD do usually realise that their extreme obsessional thoughts are irrational, but they feel very real. And they believe that the only way to relieve the anxiety caused by their obsession, which is not a bad thing from happening, is to perform certain behaviours impulsively, which is where the C in OCD comes from. These behaviours include avoidance and seeking reassurance, along with things that we're more used to seeing in media, like tidying or cleaning or flicking light switches on and off. These compulsive behaviours are carried out to prevent perceived harm. 
emotion at the time of the zoom, it's painful and irrational. Again, there's no joy that comes from obsessions and compulsions. You're not whistling happily as you tidy up. There is terror in the brain, and your brain is repeatedly firing false alarm signals. I feel like Scrubs portrayed this particularly well. So, Dr. Kevin Casey, played by Michael J. Fox, who I also mentioned by the way, his physician is in video, has extreme OCD. It's beneficial in that he's practiced things over and over again until he does them perfectly, and he has compulsively memorized every medical textbook that he can. It's a show full of quirky characters, and he's just a novel. Starting out his first day by touching literally everything in the first patient's room while saying think, which is initially played for laughs, but very deliberately the episode slowly starts to show that it isn't fun. He can't enter or exit a room without timing his last step to his breath. And when the stress of trying to control how much his first day in a new environment affects him, he's left unable to stop washing his hands over and over again for hours, despite being exhausted and desperate to finish so he can go home. So there was a character called Dr. Kevin Casey, who I think was like probably the first time that I saw OCD on screen that wasn't in uh, one of the not so great representations that I will talk about in a bit, the uh, reality TV type representations. Um, and he, the reason why I think that his OCD on screen worked is because he was in a show called Scrubs, which was like a sitcom um, that married comedy and kind of slightly ridiculous scenarios and heightened humour, all that kind of stuff, with often more serious um, kind of cutting moments of like reality. And for me, that was kind of how the OCD was portrayed, and so it was portrayed in the same way as a lot of other things on that show were. Um, so it felt kind of felt in tune with the tone of, of everyone else's issues that were being dealt with. So you would have kind of jokes at the expense of the OCD, but you would also have, you know, him staying for two hours in the scrub room after his surgery because he can't stop washing his hands. And those two things felt um, like they were... Ooh, start that sentence again, but I'm not going to restart the recording because I'm going to just be okay with not being perfect. And so, you know, we would have these jokes kind of around his OCD and his kind of compulsions, but we would also have the more serious moment of like, oh, he's actually spent two hours in the... I want to try to get this a bit closer because I have this surgery. tendency um, to really hold emotion. everything that very that close to my face and my chest. And so that's why sometimes you'll see it kind of go off screen. So that's why I'm trying to get you guys like as close to me as I can. But I did feel like it fit into the tone of that show and was portraying it in a way that was maybe a little bit more complicated than the, oh, I just get a bit irritated if my pencils are out of order sort of vibe. I remember seeing that episode for the first time on TV and how much it's stayed with me since. It's, it's a really powerful look into the side of the disorder that isn't much talked about. And that's a really important thing that media can do for us. But there is only so much we can understand from an outside perspective. And that, I feel, is why rituals are often believed to be the defining trait of OCD. But in reality, it's actually an anxiety disorder that causes repeated unwanted thoughts. Rituals are simply attempts to stop those thoughts and may have nothing to do with order. A person suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder will be impacted on some or all aspects of their daily life, sometimes becoming severely distressed, leading to some nature of impairment or even disablement for hours at a time, each and every day. Is this level of impact on the person what makes OCD a disorder? It's worth noting also that, like most disorders, OCD exists on a spectrum, and its presentation can vary greatly from person to person how much stress the person is dealing with. On-screen representations can also span from one to two quirky behaviours to a crippling inability to function. Either way, it's likely a disability superpower, which turns the character into a genius detective. It's usually a genius. <laughs> to non-sufferers, the thoughts and fears related to OCD could often seem profoundly shocking because they can be very violent, indecent, but they are involuntary thought, not just fantasies to be acted upon. And natural fact, OCD are the least likely people that actually act on such thoughts. No one told Hollywood, but we'll get to that later in our bad representation section. Interestingly, obsessional thoughts are actually quite commonplace in the general population, not just for those that suffer with OCD. Researchers working in the US, the UK, and Canada have shown that up to 80% of people report unwanted, intrusive thoughts with content that is often identical to that of obsessions found in obsession. I get the obsessive thoughts. The occasional intrusive thought, no matter how disturbing or horrific 
like Is intrusive, I mean. I can't be at the top of the ledge without this kind of nagging feeling that I should I should jump off it. I really like being flying. I try to make sure that I go over small bridges quickly so I can just go back to the point of this I, um, I get the intrusive thought thing sometimes if I'm really depressed and I'll look at pills and I'll be like, you should just pop those, you know, but your brain knows like, okay, no, you're not going to do that, right? Yep. Yeah, how often... Fuck, I love her dress. That velvet dress is just goals. Yes. Plant parenting. Which reminds me, I have to water my plants today. But you're learning. But I'm also learning. It makes both the kind of devil on this shoulder and the angel on this shoulder very happy. Also, there are closed captions on all of the Skillshare originals and stock pics videos, and um, excellent. Personally, caring for plants has been a really effective way of just adding calm into a very fraught world, and it's been lovely to be able to learn more tips. Christopher sees plant care as a part of self discovery because, spoiler. Yes. And taking care of your plants, in a way, is a way for you to nurture yourself as you are nurturing something else. So, she develops the disorder while she's 
this here, if my machines, my sewing machine was set up properly, um, I would save a little bit of time. And this part here, I would fully sew on the machine. Just this, just this one part here, because this one part here is going to be flipped. But for now... That just reminded me of like, I've always, like when I was younger, I was always scared of um, being seen as racist or like, so, yeah, she literally just said it, I'm actually racist. And I was like, I was always like petrified of that because I'm from a small town. We don't have, well, we didn't, no, we still don't really. Well, starting to now, but it, it, the frustrating part of down home, like that's not where I live now, but the frustrating part is the only reason we have people from different countries there is because they bring them in to work jobs that other people don't want, which great for them. They get to get out of the country, but and, and, and you know, go and work. But unfortunately, it's like temporary visas, so they don't get to stay, you know, not usually. Um, and I'm sure that like quite often it's like, I don't know, I'm just, I just see in my mind like that, you know, other people just kind of look down on them and I don't like that. But yeah, that, like, that was always something. And I remember at one point, because I had like a pile of gay guy friends, but I had no, um, no lesbian friends. And I was like, what if I'm secretly prejudiced against lesbians? It like it was just yeah an intrusive thought. I was like, oh my god, what if I'm you know secretly prejudiced against lesbians? You know, just a worry of mine. But then like one of my friends brought his friend to hang out with us who who was lesbian, and we freaking got along like crazy. And then like once like that was away, it just hit me that you're not like why were you even worried about that? You weren't prejudiced. You just there's no freaking lesbians in your town. That's why you've never met any. <laughs> Yeah, says the woman now dating a lesbian, you know, but yeah, my anxiety and stuff was so bad as a kid, like. I love her dress. I love her kitchen. One day I will have that beautiful kitchen. Including cousin Tommy. Twenty twenty. 
and their OCD will convince them that doing such a ritual keeps their loved ones safe by not contaminating them. This is heightened sense of responsibility and need to protect loved ones. I'm going to have to get some beeswax and make myself a beeswax block. Or find my existing beeswax blocks. But finding it easier to teach others or further, such as repeating a specific phrase in their mind or counting facts. Because normally when I'm hand sewing, I like to wax my thread. Which means they have intrusive thoughts, but not compulsions. George in Seinfeld kind of shows some signs of this. In the episode The Note, he begins to obsessively fear he is secretly gay, secret even from himself, after receiving a massage from a male masseuse. Jerry also shows kind of broader signs of just the dislike for germs that border still pathological. Elaine even warns him that his odd tendencies could become OCD if he isn't careful and doesn't get any help. In one episode, he's faced with more germs than usual, and it does push him over the edge temporarily. Let's move on to things people with OCD are not. Vampires. Yeah, really. According to ancient legends, vampires have a compulsion to camp, and thus scattering grain is a good way to stop a vampire they will be compelled to just come oh, yeah. in which gives the victim time to escape. It's been used in such varying works as the X-Files, where Nolte defeated a vampire by spilling his sunflower seeds, and Dracula 2, Ascension, where, um, I mean, it doesn't really work, because the kids just, like, throw the seeds, and then Dracula slows down time so he can count them. But they don't explore. That's known modern vampire with this feature as Sesame Street's The Count, but apparently that was just some kind of an accident, and they didn't know that vampires count stuff. OCD That's kind of hilarious. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Whilst OCD is an anxiety disorder with compulsions and behaviors that alleviate anxiety from unwanted or impulsive thoughts, we're almost OCD there, guys. Is a personality disorder. So, a person with OCPD is globally meticulous and nitpicky, desiring order in every aspect of their life, and they don't suffer distress from being aware that their behavior is irrational, as someone with OCD does. Someone with OCPD doesn't really suffer distress from their behaviour and use it as the best way of doing things. The distress with OCPD comes from someone else screwing with their system, not from their behaviour itself, although there's nothing to prevent someone from having both OCD and OCPD at the same time, so they may need to have those things. But, however, OCPD is quite rare. Probably a pretty well-known example of this would be Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang yes. Theory. I know, I mentioned him in my video on social media, but there's actually a really big overlap between people with autism and OCD ADHD. Also, the writers haven't explicitly said that he was one way or the other, so let's armchair diagnose a fictional character. No. The only type of armchair diagnosis that is acceptable. Sheldon has many repetitive compulsions related to money. He always has to knock on Penny's door three times, saying her name after each knock. Anytime Penny messes up his rhythm by opening the door before he's finished or interrupting him, he feels that it's just wrong. He also has a favourite cushion on the sofa that is his spot, and when it became stained, he spent the time in which the cushion was being cleaned slowly losing his mind, eventually crouching over the spot where he used to sit. He also throws out food when it isn't logically ordered or sized, including one occasion where he throws away prawns because they're all the same size and that doesn't give him a logical urge to eat them in bulk. Which gives some good visualisation, really, of the fact that OCD is actually miserable by representation. Yep. Again, organisation is not fun. I mean, I find it fun, but it's not fun for me with OCD. It's a vicious cycle, and whilst compulsions relieve the anxiety momentarily, the thoughts always come back worse. And hiding OCD in public is very difficult, especially when the compulsions are overt, like tapping or blinking. And it doesn't just make you a super cute musical detective. I mean, as much as I love that show, Perot, he's, he's not it. His little moustache is so cute, though. <laughs> Perot is the star of 33 books and 56 short stories by Agatha Christie, and one of the most famous fictional detectives in the world. He's also exceptionally conceited, so he's probably not just my cup of tea. Originally a Belgian police detective, he became a refugee when World War I broke out and ended up in a tiny English village of Stiles St. Mary. Naturally, whilst he was there, someone was murdered, which is, um, I mean, it's quite a common occurrence around him, so go for it, you know what I mean. I'm a pretty big Burrow fan, I have to admit, and I still wouldn't go to tea with him, I value my life too much. In my eyes, I think Burrow probably has more OCPD, I'm not a doctor. He wants everything orderly, and he frequently complains that eggs will fall from the little cube. In the book, his fastidious nature, his kind of clever scheming, love of personal comfort, perception of fine details, 
details and green eyes, before much has been compared to the cat, because he notices everything that's out of order. In some books, it's handled more of a quirk of personality, although it does sometimes trip him up. In the TV show, it's definitely slightly more like a disability, and there are some occasions where he's stopped from doing things he wants to do due to his obsession with symmetry and order, but generally it's portrayed as just really cute. He's quirky. There's also a type of representation that I don't necessarily see as good or bad because it's not really representation at all. Um, it's uh, characters that are like bred as having OCD because of particular traits that they hold, um, but it's not explicit in the text itself. Um, and this again is like something that happens with most representations. We have people who uh, are like queer coded that we might read as being LGBT um, within a narrative. Um, I know that obviously uh, last one of these videos Jessica talked about autism tropes in media. Really interestingly there is a, a particular element of both OCD representation and autism representation that kind of has this crossover that means that there's a few characters who kind of are read as either and or autistic or having OCD. So for example like Monica from Friends or Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory with the idea of you know a character who likes things a certain way, who's quite into things being very organised or having a particular routine um, which, which can be read as both and I think that it's it can just be useful from uh, you know the point of view of a viewer who just want to see themselves to have these characters that they identify with I think that works but I also think that the people who are actually writing the characters need to do more to like explicitly create representation rather than just rely on people to like find a sense of belonging or find a character they relate to where the writers didn't necessarily need to write them that way. Monica Geller from Friends can tell if the furniture has been moved even an inch and will have a near panic attack at the thought of it, but her buffer was kind of fluctuated a bit in the run-up of the episode. One episode charmed her into the apartment to make Monica happy, and when Monica came home, she, I mean, she did notice that things were moved, um, but she thought that the gesture was sweet. And that she didn't mind it at all. So you can stop saying she's so OCD. Equally, Bree from Desperate Housewives definitely was portrayed as having the disorder at the start of the series because she's in deep distress when things are out of place. Um, but we're not supposed to sympathise with her, we're supposed to find it weird and laugh, even though we see how it kind of destroys her relationships. She magically starts to get better as the series goes along though, and by the end just like tells people off for not using a coaster. Lee also leaned into the OCD is kooky and weird kind of group with their character Emma Pillsbury, who was such a severe misphobe that made her feel like she had it, that she cleaned every grape individually before eating it. At the same time though, they kind of just played her off as a neat freak who can give her out of spending an hour cleaning the furniture shelf there. I mean, we, the audience, weren't necessarily interested mm -hmm. in why she was doing those things or see the distress. We were kind of just meant to be amused at the start. However, the depiction of OCD on the show did get better as it went on, although it still wasn't perfect. She was known to have anxiety and panic attacks, along with ritualistically rubbing hand lotion into her hands whilst counting, and she eventually does seek help. So yeah. OCD is a sick study. Obsessions, compulsions, and hiding them through fear of judgment sounds exceptionally exhausting. Since it's hard for people to open up about OCD symptoms, some people go for decades undiagnosed, and that can then lead to depression. Since when you're not able to access help, you can spend all day obsessing and compulsing. Mental illness is hard and is made worse by an inability to speak up, which is fed into by the stigma that media creates. Imagine opening up to someone that you think you might have OCD, only to hear back, we're all a bit OCD sometimes. That's why Monica's my favourite friend. Say what now? As well as people saying phrases like, oh yeah, I'm a bit OCD, oh yeah, I'm a little bit OCD about that, it's like, no, you're not. You're not a little bit obsessive compulsive, you're just a little bit tidier than a normal person. Saying phrases like that could lead a lot of people to worry about their own OCD and maybe think that they're overthinking it or maybe thinking that they don't actually have OCD when they do and they need to be treated as such. Because if somebody doesn't think they have OCD, but they do, you can imagine the stress and anxiety going through their brain because they're thinking, oh my god, I'm a freak, I'm a weirdo, and I need to be like, I need to be sectioned or something, you know what I mean? Monk. Yes, there's an entire section of this video specifically about the show Monk, Stephen Kravitz, pretty controversial, even amongst those with OCD, as in, some people like it and some don't. Monk is a detective drama that aired on USA Network from 2002 to 2009. It follows Adrian Monk, a former San Francisco police inspector, who suffered a nervous breakdown after the murder of his wife Trudy. As a lifelong sufferer of OCD, his phobia 
serious and obsessions with him crippling after the breakdown, forcing his retirement, but he is frequently called in to consult on cases which baffle the police, as his OCD was the reason why he was such a successful policeman. One of his concoctions is paying amazing attention to details. He recovers throughout the series, though he's never fully cured. His disorder is integral to his unique mind and ability to solve cases, but it really restricts his life so much that he has a carer, former nurse Sharona, with him at all times until she gets the switch for a new nurse in Italy. Who accidentally faded his staff out of the house and really needs the month to solve a case of why he was even there. Of course, the one case that most I'm trying to solve for years is his wife Judy's murder, and each season of the show kind of brings him a little closer to finding a baffling mystery behind her death, with the show's final season then proving the case too close for good. Monk is a really interesting show. For once, we just kind of not seeing that, that cocky detective who sure he knows everything, or else would choose the answer for the bad guys who are on the back foot. Instead, because Monk inevitably looks very uncomfortable at all times, the suspect is generally pretty confident that he's going to get away with everything, and that's pretty much what makes the comedy. Because no one ever explains to the people being questioned why Monk acts in certain way, which is, I mean, I guess we're meant to laugh at the things he does most of the time. However, he is also portrayed sympathetically, and I guess we're always all laughing at people who are laughing at things. Unlike Poirot, Monk does not enjoy his ability to notice everything. OCD is portrayed as a seriously so I'm pushing all of the um, seam allowances towards here. Can you guys see it? Ah, there we go. So I'm pushing it here so that I can pull this in. Sorry, I'm just trying to stretch it. Oh, 
common OCD fixations like being unable to walk through lines between paving stones and only using disposable forks, even in restaurants. We, we, are you just a bigot who uses his compulsions to be a general asshole to everyone around him? Just okay, bad no. representation is completely non scripted. But I also think there's you know, bad representation, which is either like ill informed or spreads misinformation, not necessarily maliciously, and it's not even misinformation which makes people look particularly bad, it's just wrong information. And then you have the ones like stuff that's in um, reality TV, which is more kind of exploitative to individuals, as well as having that potential misinformation, or at least not necessarily giving someone all the information to like fully understand beep, 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 beep. disorder. So, one of the reasons why this misinformation can be quite harmful and damaging is. Like for me, for example, I had the symptoms of OCD from when I was a kid, from when I was really little, and as I grew up, I didn't realise that that was what I had, I didn't realise what was going on, because that was never something that was portrayed as anything to do with OCD, like intrusive thoughts, for example, were just not, I mean, I never really saw them mentioned anywhere, unless it was like someone was hallucinating, or they were having visions, or, you know, it was something supernatural in a horror movie, but it definitely wasn't in Charles OCD, and it wasn't until I started to explore and like research myself that I managed to come to that conclusion when I was a teenager and I know that if I had had those kind of portrayals I definitely way earlier would have understood what was happening to me and it wouldn't have been so kind of isolating and anxiety inducing to try and like figure out what was going on inside my brain. Let's move on to good representation. So I don't know if I've just been looking in the wrong places but I don't necessarily think I've ever seen a like actively good representation of OCD on screen and I've definitely never seen a representation of OCD, OCD which feels like it represents the particular like sub-diagnosis I have in my experiences. So the only accurate portrayal that I've ever seen in any form of film or programme is from a series called Pure. It was a series made in the UK, I think Channel 4 made it, and basically it's about a girl who has some really intrusive, violent, sexual, extreme thoughts. And throughout the series, these thoughts just cause her a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety because of course she just doesn't have any idea why she's having them or where they stem from. She eventually has to come to terms with her thoughts and actually open up about them and she eventually has to come she eventually has to come to terms with her thoughts and open she then eventually has to come to terms with her thoughts and open up about them and let me tell you from somebody who suffers with OCD telling people your most intrusive and deepest darkest thoughts can be quite overwhelming and to be honest I can count the number of people on one hand not even one hand one finger that I've told about my deepest darkest thoughts when you have OCD and you don't really understand the thoughts yourself externalizing them can just be really really anxiety inducing i think the best thing about this program is it gives a real accurate description on what pure ocd is like and what ocd can be like instead of just including the clean free character who just who loves to clean and loves to keep everything tidy it's like not everybody with ocd has those thoughts Oops, sorry guys which by the way I loved this BBC drama series centered on a new current affairs show being launched by the BBC in like June 1956 at the time of the Suez Crisis, written by Abby Morgan, who also wrote Suffragette, The Iron Lady, and The Split, which my wife and I are really obsessed with. Um, it's starring Ben Whishaw, Dominic West, Kimberly Garay, Anna Chancellor, and Lou Chapman. Good thing I said the first name. Belle Rowley is the producer of the show and finisher. Her friend Freddie Lyon, played by Whishaw, Lose this representative interview to his well-spoken Eton boy, Hector Madden, played by West, which she persuades him to stay on as a researcher. Meanwhile, Freddie is suspicious that the reported suicide in the ball There we go. So now I'm just double checking the here because the first time I did this, some of it was a little too close, so I actually had to go back because it was showing some of the lining, but it doesn't look like this one I actually did really well, so I won't need to. Awesome. There. Oh, this is exciting. So exciting. Okay. Like his OCD report creates his genius. The film has the familiar notes, 
Oh, my hip, my hip, my hip, my hip. Oh, oh shit, where'd my needle go? I'm pretty sure. Did I, didn't I put my needle in here? There we go. <laughs> I knew it was in here. I so really YouTube, need to get myself um, a little block of wax. Wax my thread so it doesn't do that. They are literally a, a person with OCD representing themselves. Um, and although I think that because of the stigma and the taboo around things like intrusive thoughts or compulsions or, you know, all of this stuff that's wrapped around um, mental illness, OCD especially means that people might not feel as confident to entirely expose themselves to their experiences online. When people do, that can be a really, really powerful thing. Based on current estimates for the UK population, there are around three quarters of a million people living with OCD at any given time. However, a disproportionately high number of those, about 50% of those cases, fall into the severe category, with less than a quarter being classed as mild cases. Sufferers used to go undiagnosed for many years partly because of lack of understanding of the condition, but also partly because people went to great lengths to hide their symptoms due to the intense feeling of embarrassment, guilt, and sometimes even shame. Remember, these obsessive thoughts are generally not things the sufferers believe in, but rather things they hugely disagree with. Generally, OCD starts to impact on a person's life during late adolescence for men and during the early 20s for women, although onset can affect a wide range of ages, with some developing the disorder as young. OCD will impact on individuals regardless of gender, social or cultural background. If you find that you're struggling with intrusive thoughts that you can't control and compulsions that you just can't get a handle on and believe you might have obsessive compulsive disorder, then it's vital to speak to someone and to get some help in order to stop your symptoms from getting worse. You are not alone and you're going to be okay. There 
every day would end up like month, obsessively noticing everything, and in need of a nurse to follow you around. Well, there's so much if you do. I have a carer with me pretty much all the time, and I'm amazing. It's important to realize that some degree of OCD type symptoms are probably experienced at one time or another by most people, especially in times of stress. And this is a pretty damn stressful year. However, the phrase, everybody's got a bit OCD, is just a mouthful. OCD can have a devastating and distressing impact on a person's entire life, <laughs> from education, work, and career advancement to social life and personal relationships. I've linked some organizations that are in the description and in a pinned comment that might be able to help you. If anyone else has others, then please do comment on the comment and I will add them to the original one. I've also linked all of Charlie and Rowan's social media profiles. Go and follow them everywhere. Thank you to both of them for contributing to this video and for helping me with the script. And finally, thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Remember to click their link in my description and I will see you in my next video. Bye bye! Hand sewing is always best done while sitting and watching TV. So. Ah, no. Okay, this isn't going to give me a problem on this side, is it? No, I don't think so. It's just because I'm noticing that there's a little bit of looseness here. What's Abby is talking about? And we'll never be able to uncover these mysteries because somehow women were able to survive hundreds of years with these bones. Oh, it's a corset video. Yeah. I fucking love Abby. Mmm. Mm. Pride and Prejudice costume review. Gorgeous scenery. That's the one that I've been trying to watch. The sexiest awkward hand flex of all time. How dare! Well, yeah, I get that, but like. Okay, so full disclosure, when I set out to make this video, I was. Colin Firth's Mr. Darcy was hot as hell.
overall look and stylistic choice. Oh god. Okay, I'm looking at the screen and these colors are just so beautiful. I really hate it when designers use shades of brown, grayish, and sadness for historical films. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Duchess. People love color in the past. Honestly, more than we do today. And I always give loads of credit to designers who play with color in historical films. Secondly, my biggest critique of this film that I just kind of need to get off my chest is that I hate it. I hated the hair, guys. The hair was oh my God, so yeah. much garbage and I hated 90% of it. I wanted to find things I liked about it, but honestly, I couldn't. Don't even get me started on what was going on with Lydia Kitty's hair. That is like some prime bicentennial... I just, I really hated this. It's terrible. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Now moving on to much better, better things. Unlike the 1995 version, which was set in the 18-teens when Pride and Prejudice was published, Joe Wright set his version earlier, in keeping with the first version of PP that was written, so somewhere around 1797 to 1800. He's quoted as saying, I find Empire line dresses are very ugly, and so I did some research. How dare you! God, that's beautiful. Somewhere between your under boob and your waist, let's call it your middle rib cage. At random points around 1799 to 1800, it wasn't a dominant trend going through the gallery of fashion and other fashion plate books. You'd see more higher waisted gowns, but this lower waistline <sighs> is critical throughout the pages for those years. Some originals in museums also appear to have this slightly lower waistline, but sometimes it's hard to really judge that. Stop catching those freaking pins, oh my god. I think trying to work with this awkward waistline was an interesting decision, and reflecting back on it right now, I can actually see how this kind of helps tell the story of age and fashion when you compare Mrs. Bennett to Lizzie to Caroline Dingley, for example. You might not be surprised at my having only six accomplished women before I've been out to marry him. Are you so severe on your own sex? I never see such things. According to the Pride and Prejudice Companion book, the designs for Lizzie were founded in a more tomboyish, natural book form approach, with a heavy leaning on natural colors and earth tones. Overall, the costumes are actually pretty okay, honestly, and there's nothing terribly exciting or overly offensive about them. I do, however, want to take a moment to talk about a few of my favorites, though. First up is my most favorite gown in this whole movie. I'm not even exaggerating. This is my favorite gown. The blue and gray striped number that she wears at Netherfield Park when Jane is sick. Now I know. It just sounds weird, but hear me out. I totally get that on some surface level, you might think this gown is ugly and weird. However, this gown is actually awesome. Because of the way it was cut and styled, which is that of a gown that was remade from an earlier style. When you really sit there and stare at it, trust me, I've stared at it a lot. The hallmarks of a remade gown are there, and I think it's just amazing. We have a center front closing with this front being on the dental bias, which was a theme for the 1780s gowns. The back of the gown has back pleats that are just kind of cut off in this really awkward area, which is a great hallmark of a remake. Also, just kind of how the skirt hangs, the neckline, oh all of it. Oh my god. Kind of details are seen in a really <laughs> gown like, that have a refashion from older styles. I'm going to just, kill this pin. It keeps catching my thread. I, I, just, I freaking love it. It's my favorite. I just love how it looks. I love the, the detail of this design and how it really helps add to the story. 
story. Was this a remake of Mrs. Bennett's old dress? Was it a remake of a dress that Lizzie wore pre-1795 when she was a bit younger? I don't know, and I don't care. All I know is that I love it, and I think it's great. Next up is everyone's favorite, that brown dress. What we could call a jumper dress is also a favorite, even though it's not perfect. Sleeveless dresses with white shirts or chemisettes were totally a thing during the 1790s, and I love how hers has this cool, casual, very relatable feel. The buttons on the neckline have a more modern appearance to them, and they don't really fit with what you see in original imagery, but I do love the concept. Also, this gown appears to be made out of wool, which I'm partial to because I think for Lizzie's character, wools make a lot more sense than the gauzy, homespunny, weird cotton dresses that she wears throughout most of the film. I really like the texture of it. As for the shirt she wears, I thought they did a nice job with it. The details of the collar and the shoulder reinforcement. This, adjustment, the guys, this, sleeves, this is why you now. wax your Just thread. Lizzie, which I think does very well for the 1790s. These chemisettes with shirts with the more masculine collar were also a trend in the 90s. And I think having her in the style does help separate her out from her sisters and does a great job conveying her character within the bounds of 1790s fashion trends. My other favorite gown that she wears is when she visits Pemberley. I really enjoyed the stripes and the shape of it, including that bias bit at the bottom. That helped make it feel a little bit more fashion forward, while the embroidery in the back was a little bit odd. I was able to find some similar Sukash designs from Spencer, so I'm assuming that they kind of drew inspiration from those motifs. My one complaint with this dress is that it felt very flat in the skirt, and I realized when she was standing in front of a window with the sun coming through it, you can see through the layers of her clothes, and there doesn't seem to be an under petticoat on. I actually found this surprising, since they do show Lizzie and Jane wearing under petticoats while getting ready for the Netherfield ball, but she doesn't seem to have one on here, and frankly that's a shame, because that would have really helped get the silhouette to looking a bit better than what it does, because I do feel like her skirt was very limp and flat throughout most of the film, which honestly is my biggest complaint with the costuming. And while I understand that clingy muslin skirts were a trend, and you can see that in fashion plates, it's one of those things where the success of this look depends on the textile. And for the late 1790s, there was a lot of fabric in the skirts, especially if the fabric was thin. Even when you get into the 1800s and 18-teens with the flat fronts of the gowns, there is still a lot of fabric in the back of the skirts to help really create an elegant shape and give some ease of movement. This one skirt issue is why I'm not as big of a fan of her other dresses in the movie, like the brown and the green and brown gowns that she wears for a lot of the film. While the green and brown round gowns were fine and classic 1790s in those cuts and designs, the skirts just felt a bit limp and I wasn't terribly fond of the fabric choices. They looked too thin and flimsy, almost as if they were going to just shatter and fall apart. If we're working within this natural feel of a character in the countryside, I would have liked to have seen a more practical fabric used lightweight worsted wools or a heavier weight linen. This is a really minor critique. I just kept looking at these fabrics and thinking how poorly woven and limp they were looking. It didn't feel fully within the realm of Lizzie to wear such an impractical fabric that also wouldn't have lasted a long time. This is in contrast to her blue stripe and brown wool gowns, which are very much in keeping with Lizzie's character choices. When you look at more average, everyday clothes that survive in museums, there is a hardness to them, a substantialness to them. They have this weight and quality to them that feels very wholesome and like just there and sturdy and yeah. And I feel like I'm describing beef stew now. <laughs> that. For example, these gowns in the Colonial Wafer collection are great examples of normal everyday clothes that are beautiful as well as practical. Also given Lizzie's propensity for going on walks outside for hours at a time with little regard to the mud, I would hope that she'd wear a better fabric for this pastime unless her goal was to actually make a laundress who takes care of her clothes really pretty. <laughs> I hate you, Lizzie. <laughs> Overall, I liked the design choices for Lizzie, how they integrated her character into the clothing. It created a really nice contrast to the 1995 Lizzie, who actually looked like she just literally fell out of an Ackerman's repository. Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley. If I had to pick a better dressed sister, it's going to be Jane. I like her costumes better. But I also fully embrace that I, my love of pink and blue uh, far outweigh my love of the color brown because I am not an earth tone girl. I'm a winter, okay? According to the director and designer Jacqueline Duran, Jane is supposed to be the most fashion forward in the family. And the way that I see that translated is that they stuck to a more fashionable and normal higher waist with her gowns. The costumes are a bit spread out date-wise. Her blue fleece that has a very strong 18-teens feel. Her open robe and round gowns that are great examples of the 1790s. I particularly enjoy the fullness and shape of her Netherfield ball gown. It's simple, it's cool, and a great example of the 1790s 
Oh, that's right. so pretty. Also, like, 10 points to the stitchers who did the hand stitching on the necklines of her gowns because you can see that in the film and it's just chef's kiss. I see you. I acknowledge you. And I appreciate you. Thank you for all that you do. I also want to give a special shout out to the morning gown that she wears when she goes down to breakfast and is just kind of around the house sometimes. I, I love it so much. It's just, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good, guys. Like, it's just. <laughs> to be fair, it is a bit more 18 teens in its cut and styling, but I just love how the actress Rosamund Pike wears it, just loosely, semi-tied, falling open, just whatever. Like, these little adjustments help bring these pieces forward as clothing and not just as costumes, which I think can often be lost in translation when we look at stagnant museum exhibition or portraits. The realness and diversity of how people wore their clothing can be lost by that, and seeing these kinds of little details just make me extremely happy. You know, these were people's clothes, right? Like, it wasn't just one way to wear a garment. It wasn't just you had to wear your kerchief tucked into your neckline or not tucked into your neckline. <laughs> There's nuances and personal preference and personal comfort, and so to see her play with that within these costumes and really make them appear to be clothes and behave like clothing is just, mm, it's so good. I just, oh, it's so good to see that kind of comfort in the actress with her clothing and with her costumes. It just really helps with the believability of everything. Miss Elizabeth Bennett. Next up is Caroline. This is gonna be really short and sweet to the point. I don't really have that much to say about Caroline. Basically, like, yeah, she looks great. You know, she obviously was dressed closer to the 18 teens with that smooth front of her gowns and a more fashionable under the bust look. I do love how they put her in the sleeveless number for the ball to make her like really fashion forward. And then the red silk gown that she wears when spending time with Lizzie, I know the field part, like, it's lovely, it's great. That's it. That's cool. Well, we may not visit if you do not, as you well know, Mr. Bennett. Yes, we will have a Papa. Alright, so this next one's actually pretty hard for me because we need to talk about Mrs. Bennett. And Mrs. Bennett's costumes are both fantastic and problematic. And are a reflection of my overall just general complaints with the design decisions for this movie. And just kind of historical films in general and just kind of weird ideas that people have about the past. And it is this. Just because you're a woman of a certain age does not mean that you are dressed in the fashion of your youth. Can we please just put this to rest? The evidence that survives shows actually just the opposite of this weird idea. And look, while I understand that they did this as a way to show age and not poverty, because literally every woman over the age of 40 is dressed in styles 1770 and earlier, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, more money than God, it bugs the crap out of me because women over 40 still love fashion and women over 40 still want to be fashionable and that there were styles and fashions and accessories worn by older women that would signify their age but still keep them in the same, oh, I don't know, decade. I just really hate this idea that people who are older in the past just magically stopped caring about their clothes and, and looking fashionable and being on trend and, and being considered just like a normal participant in society that over you, like the moment you become a certain age, all of a sudden you just stop caring. It's not like we see people today dress exactly like they're wearing, like they're not wearing the same types of clothes from the 70s that they wore in their youth. Like my mom is over a certain age and she doesn't dress like she did in the 70s. Like she dresses like a woman over a certain age in 2020 dresses. Like, she doesn't, it's just weird. And why wasn't Mr. Bennett dressed then like a sofa? Like, he <laughs> like everybody else, basically. I mean, maybe he had a more conservative, older style cut of jacket. He didn't look like that. Like, why do the women look this way? Allow women just over the age of 40 to participate in fashion in the past. Allow them to actually give a shit about on pure waist gowns. Allow them to be interested and fashion changes. Don't force them to wear what they wore when they would have been 20. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. It's, and frankly, it's lazy. It's cool to explore what older people would have worn during different fashion 
period. Like, what would have women over the age of 40 who was a mother, what would she have worn to make her look different from her daughters? You know, like, that's interesting stuff that's fun to explore. I think leaning on this, like, they dressed in the fashions of their heroes. Look, clothing was remade over and over and over and over again. And 1770s and 80s gowns were easily remade into 1790s and 1800s style gowns. Labor was very inexpensive compared to the cost of the material. And so having gowns and clothing remade uh, to be updated was extremely common for both women and men. It would have only cost a few shillings to have a gown remade and updated to the more fashionable silhouette. Mrs. Bennet is gauche, a gossip, money-focused, way too indulgent of her ridiculous younger daughters, and shows a lack of Georgian manners and propriety. So it would actually make sense for Mrs. B to try and dress up too trendy to make a spectacle of herself in public as if she is trying to pretend she's as young as her daughters instead of just dressing 20 years out of fashion and that concept of making a spectacle of oneself in dress and older women trying to dress younger than they are were both common satirical themes during the 18th and 19th centuries and so i honestly think that they missed out on a really good opportunity here to help tell the story and show character via the costumes by relying on a really tired mood Oh, so guys, I gotta get my pin cushion. I just fell. We're almost done. Yeah. I guess the biggest thing about Penny and Lydia that I did like was how they seemed to have like raided their mother's wardrobe and they took out all these cute little jackets and short gowns like from the late 1780s and early 90s and they wore them in this like literally like a deshabillé sort of way. And the cut and style of the gowns do kind of play nicely with that they're teenagers and not really children but they're not really full adults either sort of way. And I also really like the So we are going to. We're going to take a small break from um, sewing to go get some food quickly. Where's my remote? I want to talk about one more thing. The corsets and stays that were actually worn in this One room. last time. Slow clap. That's a good thing. You don't see much in the ways of under being worn in this movie, but when you Spiral lacing. Spiral lacing. Oh my god, my hips. Ooh. Owie. Okay, where is my remote so I can freaking pause this? There it is. I may or may not have actually texted people about the spiral lacing in the States, and I am not ashamed. <sighs> spiral lacing is a godsend. Hello, it's me. Mommy's going to get a bit of food because she's hungry. One last time. What time is it? Two something. 
I should be taking my second dose of Ritalin soon. But food first. There's got some fucking hungry hands. Ooh. Oh, that looks really good. What's this one? Turkey with Italian sausage. 28 grams of protein per. I wonder. Let me see if I. I'm gonna ask permission to cook for Claire if I can steal one of her hungry man, her crave. Um, Claire, Claire, my love. Claire, 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 where are you? Can I steal a crave meal? Because <laughs> I don't feel like cooking. Sometimes we don't. Because um, right now I just want to finish my waistcoat. But this sweet potato with tangy pork sounds really good, but so does the turkey with Italian sausage. 25 grams of protein, 28. This one has 28 grams of protein. Starbucks! Where's my Starbucks? <laughs> I want some Starbucks. I'm like looking at this and like, mm, nom, 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 nom. I'm like... Okay. Sorry, I'm just looking for the instructions. Okay, cook. Microwave. Remove from tray, out of curtain, pull back corner vent. On high, three minutes. Pull back, replace, on high, two minutes. Let's see. Okay. That should take. Oh. <laughs> I feel alive too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when you're in a sewing mood, you're like, I I don't wanna cook something that takes long. I just I just I just wanna get this done. Okay. Um Pull back corner of film for vent. And then cook for three minutes. And yes, I always check out instructions. Um, oh, Nat, did you see my fur that I just got? So, I kind of... I got myself some uh, gorgeous gorgeous thrifted fur oh, so good. So good. so this I think is a fox fur it, oh, it's so soft and like I was going on this like small rant about thrifted fur and how thrifted fur is okay because if you're using thrifted fur the animal that died isn't being wasted you're appreciating and reusing something that would end up in the landfill you know but, oh, it's so soft. It's so soft. <laughs> I'm just like oh um and like very much the like I, I like I was saying like ADHD has ties to autism spectrum and like just the feel of fur just relaxes me so much like oh yeah Exactly, exactly. Um, like, to me, if you're gonna, if you do want to use fur, use thrifted fur or get ethically sourced fur, aka, like, say, a farm that is raising animals for meat and then they're using every part of the animal. So, you know, that way it's like, okay, well, they, are, they were gonna kill it anyway for meat, you know, but like, it, even then, not factory farm animals. Like a small farm where the animal was raised with love and had a wonderful life, that kind of thing. Or um, there are um, certain um, 
native uh, tribes that they're uh, they do population control and then they do use every part of the animal as well and then they they sell um, their excess um, furs and skins and different things like that to make extra money for their reserves that kind of thing is also a good place to put money in oh, it's, so soft. Mm, it's so good so good so good mm, my happy place <laughs> I'm definitely gonna put some of these on some coats one last time I don't know I, like sometimes I wonder like how old these are mm. <laughs> like, I look like one of those like uh, except my hair and my makeup isn't done but like all wrapped up in the fur I'm like I look like one of those like starlets from like those eras there that would wrap themselves up in fur and be all luxurious <sighs> three minutes and then it's gonna be stir replace film on high for two minutes let's stand in my curry for one or two okay one last time it's 28 grams of protein so which means I probably won't even be able to eat all of it in one sitting but Ooh, that looks like a white sauce. Fuck, I love white sauce. Stirring, mixing. Stir, 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 stir. And then put the food back on. Don't forget that fork in there. Are we going to get a fire? So guys, I'm going to put you in. Yeah. No, I totally get it, Nat. Sometimes we got to work, right? We got to be responsible adults, even though it sucks. Okay, where's... Where'd the piece go? Ah, there you are. You're just trying to melt... To the oh why why you do this to me okay there we go Much better. okay two minutes no not 20 minutes two minutes there. not bad for a microwavable dish I'm not usually a microwavable meal kind of gal hurt your back do you want me to put you down buddy do you want to go down okay let's pick you up oh oh, oh we've got this old man we're gonna put him down there we go oh. <laughs> does Casey want to come down too i think so okay okay oh i got you i got you okay now i can do the bed Esme, get down i'm about to do the bed <laughs> One last time. I keep having songs in my head. <sighs> okay, let's just. I have a little hook here that I um, hook up like my eye mask and my CPAP mask here. Hi, Esme. I'm trying to make the bed. Then there's like a cat all wrapped up in the blanket. She's like, come on, mom. <laughs> I know, but I gotta make the bed. Oh, I gotta, ooh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, move. Thank you. The dogs have kind of like dirtied this white bed uh, blanket. So I'm gonna have to like, Get it, soak it in some OxyClean or something and get it nice and clean. Uh, ah, there's the microwave bell. Uh.